a lot, lot to me. So no, I was surprised but, when you said some, that. Some of them are 30%, 40%. Some of them are even lower than that. Wow. And, and the other reason that's significant is because a lot of bar associations – um, we don't have very many large law firms. I think our largest law firms are around 40 lawyers. So that's considered a medium-sized firm. Um, but medium-sized and large firms p typically pay your bar fees to, oh. to your bar association. So the fact that we have that many who pay on their own it really awesome. yeah, speaks well of, of the uh, legal community here. That's outstanding. And we provide, so we're, we're, we try to be a liaison between the court and uh, the attorneys for how to improve their practice, if there are procedural things they need to know, the, the probate court and the family law court, they hold uh, regular, I believe, quarterly roundtables for attorneys who practice in their courts, if there are any changes, if, um, if there are documents that they need to, to change or the way they provide them. And then we also provide lawyers with continuing legal education. So, so that's uh, one of the big things, but then we're really, focusing on and and something that the bar got away from but we're we're working since i've come along to get back is to be have a greater presence in the community so we do have a small claims court clinic for people we have a um, currently we have a program called lawyers in the library where people can come it's a quarterly at different libraries lodi tracy uh, or stockton where people can come and they get a brief few minutes with an attorney to talk about a case and whether it could be referred out to a you know a bigger um, paying attorney and then we also have just started to embark on what we call we have sections in the bar so if you're a family lawyer or a, a criminal lawyer we have criminal law sections but we're also um, ramping up our what we call affinity sections and so those aren't those aren't groups of lawyers that get together because of a particular practice of a law but because of an area of interest so we have the we have the women lawyer section. We have the young lawyer section. We're just launching an Asian Pacific Islander section. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to launch other sections, including the Latino, Latinx uh, section, because we want to be able to be present in the community and representative of the entire community and making sure that people see people who look like them, who, who get them. Who they so can th relate to. So that they can relate to, so that they don't feel like that great big 13-story building is off limits to them or that uh, lawyers are off limits to them and so we want so one of the things that we're working with with the API uh, Asian Pacific Islander section I'm really excited about is having the lawyers instead of lawyers in the library but going to the community centers awesome. um, for the communities so that there will be um, and that where they can pe people can meet lawyers wonderful um, and talk to them Wonderful. So those are the kinds of things we do. And that's, that's refreshing to hear that you're taking steps to try and break the ice so that people don't feel intimidated because they need to be able to resource lawyers as a way to get help if they're depending on their situation. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's a huge problem, uh, really, really well-funded. You know, people with lots of resources don't have any problem accessing mm -hmm. lawyers. Um, and people in certain circumstances who have no resources can access some lawyers, uh, particularly in criminal matters. But there's a swath of people in the middle, a huge swath, um, that it's really hard. And, and it's, it's not a service that one buys on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So knowing what to buy, how to look for an attorney, those are challenges for, for people. And if we can make it more accessible and less mysterious, I mean, the justice system, the court is paid for by the public. Uh, those are those are public funds. It is part of it's an essential part of our democracy. It's one of the three branches of government. So people, it shouldn't be mysterious for people, um, and it should be accessible. Do you want to address any of those things that you just mentioned about knowing what to buy? Because it's not a commodity, and there's not a lot of information on why you might choose one lawyer versus another. Right now. Um, so it's always a good idea to ask for referrals, to talk to people who, who may know. I, I get asked all of the time, <laughs> and I always have, and to the point where in, in the area of family law, I just kept a list of lawyers that I would refer people to because that seemed to be the one area where I would get questions all of the time. So it's always good, and also do, do your research always just start at the California Bar website. It's, cal, it's calbar.org, C-A-L-B-A-R dot O-R-G, and you can uh, 
put in a topic and that's where to start because that's an objective location um, and you can always, also the thing about that is when you check on the lawyers there if there's been any um, negative actions taken against them if, if they've been disciplined by the bar you can see that and not that somebody who's been disciplined can't be an effective lawyer but you certainly want to see <laughs> what they were disciplined for how long ago if there's been more than one complaint all of these things that you to protect yourself um, also so do that on the bar set there's other websites I would really caution people to stay away from <coughs> any of the commercial um, websites from any particular firm mm -hmm. you, you might want to go meet with those but don't just stop at one uh, check in with several of them our county as well as a lot of other counties around that state we have a program through the state bar called the lawyer referral service and that if you call our association uh, and we have lawyers in the area um, in the area of expertise that you're seeking for forty dollars you get a half hour consultation oh, with that lawyer um, <clears throat> and the the lawyers who who are on those lists they are vetted through a panel of lawyers and judges they they are peer reviewed to make sure they meet the qualifications to be able to handle that kind of matter wonderful what's that phone number how do they uh, reach that yeah, service so, so there are two numbers you can reach that you can call the bar association directly at 948-0125 or the um, direct line for lawyer referral services is 209-948-4620. Wonderful. That's awesome. And earlier you were talking about continuing education. Um, as a veterinarian, we are required every two years to have so many units. So talk about that with yes, lawyers. Yes. So for lawyers, it's 25 hours every three years. And uh, there's you have to have uh, at least one of those hours has to be in bias. Um, of all the different forms of bias and and ethics and so two of those hours have to be in bias and ethics and then the other hours have to be in other things and we provide so all of our different sections provide different areas uh, different topics the young lawyers the criminal law lawyer group the um, civil litigation but then we also have what we call the master series and so that's during the month of January and we do that because you have to report at the end of January. If if you're if you're in, the, the the state bar breaks you up into three groups by alphabet, and so every three years at the end of January you have to send in your report what courses you attended, um, that you fulfilled your obligation, and so every January we do a, what we call a master series, which covers all of those topic areas. It's typically um, a number of courses each week during lunch hour that people can participate in and again we have a committee that makes sure that all of those programs adhere to the standards that are required by the state bar so that the courses are certified and then we have them also throughout the year but if if somebody you know puts it off to the last minute <laughs> we make it possible <laughs> for you to go ahead and and uh, get your units that's awesome especially if you offer it during lunchtime that's that's great that's convenient yeah and if you're a member of the bar it's a lot less money than if you're not a member of the bar so. great so more incentive to be yeah. part of that 50 percent. right well what we yeah we we want people to have we want people to join the bar because they feel like they get value out of it and and so obviously mcle credits are value but we want them to feel like a we want them to feel like the bar helps facilitate their being a part of the community and an opportunity to serve. I th you know, there's, it's interesting, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of teeth gnashing around the nation right now as people aren't joining organizations in the same, in the same rate they used to. Mm -hmm. And people are asking, well, well what's, what's going on? And I think the question really needs to be, what are we as an organization not doing or mm -hmm. what, what should we be doing to, to allow more people to come in? I think part of that is we're a much more diverse society now and so mm -hmm. and people come to these organizations with much different backgrounds and experiences or and expectations or expectations too. and so how do we meet those and mm -hmm. I think it's on the because I also so I think it's on the organizations mm -hmm. uh, to to figure that out and it's not just to say oh uh, 
you know, you're welcome from, from the Asian Pacific Islander community. You're welcome. It's like, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> but what are you doing that mm-hmm. makes it relevant to members of the Asian Pacific mm-hmm. Islander community? Um, how are you going to support them and their needs? Because mm-hmm. I, what I also find is there's a huge need, and I think you do too, because I know you're out there in the mm-hmm. community. I see you everywhere where I am, and I'm not everywhere, so you <laughs> it can't just be coincidence. <laughs> uh, but I, but you, you know that there's, there's a yearning to belong and to connect. Mm-hmm. And I, so if there's that yearning to belong and connect, it's clearly the demand is there. So I think it's up, it's incumbent upon the organizations to not just what fulfills my needs or my experiences, but let's find out from other people. That's why I'm really excited about these, um, these affinity or groups. And I hope that we can really make a robust bar that, that I want, I want to be the place that when legal issues come up in the community, that leaders and the press everybody wants to say what does the bar have to say about Mm -hmm. this because i want the bar to be able to speak be a voice be a voice for all and and be representative of Mm -hmm. the entire community so that's awesome that's excellent that's the goal Uh, (laughs) that's awesome because i was going to ask you why did you want to be a part of the bar association and you answered that perfectly and you talked about how pivotal it can be in our community so how long have you been affiliated? I just Washington? joined in the middle of November. Um, the other piece I, I, I want to talk about is uh, we have a contract with the courts to implement. There's a program called the Dispute Resolution Programs Act, um, and it takes a, a, I believe it's $8. It can zero to $8 of every county, every filing, every case filing, and it puts that money to fund mediation and dispute resolution programs. And so we have been doing that on a small scale, primarily in the courts, in the small claims court arena, and the um, temporary restraining order arena and unlawful detainer arena. But really the intention of that law is to train lawyers and non-lawyers in conflict management and dispute resolution skills to help out in the community to resolve conflicts, whether it be neighbor-neighbor or um, you know, parent-child, all kinds of things, uh, consumer, uh, business person, and we can do that at a, at a very reasonable rate. There's a sliding Wonderful. scale, so if you can't afford to pay, you're not denied the service. But the, the, so the benefit of that is not only do you help people resolve their disputes so they don't have to go to court. We don't want court to be exclude we don't want you to be excluded from court because of the ability to pay, but we also want to provide high quality alternatives that are unrelated to the ability to pay. You should use them because they're effective and they're efficient. Mm-hmm. Um, but also if and one of the places we want to um, and we haven't done this yet but we're you know it's been since November <laughs> but but we want to engage with the district attorney's office. We want to engage with the Office of Violence Prevention. We want to engage um, with the, that, the new program that the mayor brought into town, uh, Advanced Peace, to see if we can't help facilitate some of that conflict Wonderful. management skills training um, and, and to be a part of all of that. Because if we can, you know, the problem is a lot of people, conflict is inevitable. Conflict mm-hmm. can actually be a good thing because it helps challenge all of us to new ideas. But it is when we abuse, don't address, ignore the conflict, and don't have the skills to resolve it uh, in a negotiated, peaceful way that it becomes very destructive. Definitely. And one aspect of that, too, is you talked about going to court, you talked about fees, but there's also people that are working paycheck to paycheck, and going to co- court means they're not working that day. Yeah, it's it's very eye-opening uh, because of our, our mediation program, uh, what we do, it's very eye-opening to sit in the small claims court or the unlawful detainer, which is people who haven't paid their rent um, or otherwise violated their uh, their rental or lease agreements and are overstaying, um, or even just the, the temporary restraining order. It's very enlightening to see that a lot of those problems, and we're hearing this in, in probate as well as family, a lot of these problems the court just the the legal resolution is not the resolution that they need Hmm. you know the 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 legal the legal resolution might solve the problem 
but it doesn't solve the pr it'll solve the presenting problem but it doesn't solve the symptoms of why are these people here why are they unable to get along why are they unable to um, to resolve these problems outside of court and and there's you know a lot of these people are are resource stretched as it is it's a, it's you know they just they don't know the system and they don't have the resources to come back and keep doing it uh, and it's you know I think we we have a way to hopefully help those people um, do what they can do without having to go to court and courts it's courts a wonderful you know litigation is an absolutely beautiful system when people are just intractable it's expensive it's, expensive. it's time consuming um, and it's appropriate for some matters it's not appropriate for every matter and so if you can find a lower cost alternative that gets you a better result you should try that first and then we can always graduate up and I really respect what you just said and I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear those words come out of a, a lawyer's mouth and it just shows that your understanding of the situation in our community with people and the poverty level and the struggles that people are going through on a day-to-day -day basis um, but it's also great to hear that there are options to resolve issues that are not necessarily just court right right and even you know the court recognizes when I have conversations with judges and um, and commissioners at the court and they recognize that they're limited you know people want to talk about certain things and they have to say I can only make my decision based upon the facts that are related to the legal issue those other facts I, I can't give you a hearing on and so the other processes let people talk about what's important to them not what's important to the law and can we go back and talk about a specific area of the law and and I'll just have you comment and whatever you're able to comment um, talk about renters rights and let's say that someone's renting an apartment and there's issues either with um, rents being jacked up high or issues with problems not getting fixed what rights does a renter have and where can they go to get help yeah the, so uh, we do have a we have a small claims court clinic um, there is a housing rights office um, I don't know the number of that if you I can get it for you later but there are places that people can go there's also the um, rural California rural legal assistance can help people on that and it is it is an issue I mean, you know, it's funny you, you talk about that because that's that's a huge problem mm -hmm. uh, particularly in high poverty areas where the property owner is actually disincentivized from not not all because I, I actually own a couple of properties that I rent out so not all all landlords are <laughs> like this but but, uh, but there is a problem where they're actually disincentivized to repair the building um, because the tenants have so little resources to fight back um, which is sad that's tragic oh it's it's it really is if if uh, there's a wonderful book called evicted uh, a gentleman looks at uh, a midwestern city similar to Stockton, you know, once a great city and then in decline. Um, and the only difference being that we're on the rebound here. Yes, but, definitely. But yeah, but, the, uh, but just how much more money they end up paying people in poverty for rent and housing and how much more challenging it becomes for them to get housing. And that's part of what you're seeing with the um, current, there's a whole bunch of reasons for people being homeless today and um, and the housing shortage uh, so there's no magic bullet unfortunately but but certainly if if people know their rights and can be protected in that process to make sure that the, they're living not living in substandard housing it goes a long way wonderful I appreciate you saying that so let's back up and talk about where your interest in the law started and why you pursued this career yeah <laughs> um, I actually uh, I actually got started in it because when I was I was an undergraduate student at University of the Pacific, um, I was the first person in my family to complete college, and I was at that time the university's business school was a school of business and public administration. And I was like, I don't want to learn anything about public administration. I don't want to do that. Um, but you were required to take some classes in it, and one of the classes, the public administration class, the professor talked about dispute resolution. And 
I had been involved in student politics in high school and I had watched my hometown Sonora um, go through this transition of a dying downtown and a bypass that you know was bypassing downtown and these transitions and and all the fights and I just thought that this dispute resolution model had such opportunity to in peop to enable people to engage in their democracy and create productive win-win solutions and so I figured well if that's what you want to do the best way to have the credibility to do that is to be a lawyer so that you you are the expert in the ultimate conflict management uh, tool which is litigation and um, <clears throat> and that's what that's what ultimately motivated me to to pursue law awesome Excellent. And what is the area of law that you practice or that is your biggest interest? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so dispute resolution, conflict management is the area. And so there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of research out there that says um, there, in dispute resolution and conflict management, it is knowing the process. Process expertise trumps subject matter expertise. So, so, uh, which I really liked because I liked being I liked the idea of being a generalist. I liked the idea of learning a whole bunch about a whole bunch of different topics. Um, I didn't the concept of having to specialize and be narrow. I I didn't think that would be interesting. I thought, mm -hmm. well, once you once you get it, then what else? Is <laughs> what's there? the stimulation? Yeah. You know, what's <laughs> the stimulation? So so the newness, the challenge of that, and so um, I don't I don't do I typically don't do family cases uh, because I. There are, and there are some cases where you do need subject matter expertise, but a lot of civil litigation, contractual um, negotiations, governmental relations, ne negotiating governmental contracts, uh, family uh, dissolution of businesses, uh, employment contract disputes, there's a wide r a range that I have mediated in my life. Awesome. Excellent. Um, and let's talk about Leadership Stockton. What was yeah. your interest in, in being a part of that? As an alumni, it's, it's very special to me. Um, but talk about Leadership Stockton and your experience and why you did it and your amazing project that your class did. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, so I love Stockton, and I grew up in Sonora. Um, but my mom and my dad and my grandparents, everybody grew up in Escalon. And my mom grew up in a family of six, and her sisters all moved to Stockton when when they got married. And so we always spent our holidays down here in Stockton. And my, my mom's brother, he moved to Modesto. And I always wanted to come to Stockton. And I just, I don't, I can't explain it. I think it's the old, I think it's the history and uh, and the water, uh, the proximity to the Delta. I, I just think all of that, uh, the agriculture just made it so much more interesting to me. So. I went to Pacific, and I wanted to come back. And then I went out and I did my career. Uh, and you were everywhere. You I, were in five cities five with cities. S's. All, never, li <laughs> never lived in a city that the name didn't start with S. Uh, and all California. I'm, I, I love this state. I just, I find it so remarkable that I can get on an airplane and I can land in San Diego and still be in California and, and have an entirely different experience. Uh, drive down I-5 and have entirely different experience, go to Palm Springs, entirely different experience, but still this California uh, ethos. And so when, when, when Stockton uh, was going through bankruptcy, I was like, I want to help. I want to make a difference. And I couldn't find a way. I, you know, I'm not independently wealthy. I needed to find a job. I couldn't find a way to, to make that happen. Um, and then a few years later, I bought a home here, and it just made sense that I just said, well, I guess the universe is telling me that, yeah, now's the time. So I, I came home, and because I, I consider this home, I had graduated from Pacific, and I'd worked here in town for a little while. And so um, I just thought, well, I've been here three years now, and how do I, how do I really help immerse myself in the community? So I, I had been through the leadership program in San Francisco when I lived there. And I thought, well, I, that was a great program because you learn about all of these places and access that you don't otherwise have. And so that was my motivation. And that's exactly what it did. I mean, the, the opportunity to meet with the police chief and the sheriff and the presiding judge and uh, for, for, for the criminal justice and to have all of these nonprofits come and talk to you and to meet with the educators and 
um, and to go visit schools and and to go see the arts and just all of these things are so eye-opening and it's it's just a way to immerse yourself in the community and so that was my motivation and you know what the group was we were very diverse had lots of different opinions and an amazing class (laughs) not just diverse but huge community leaders people that were already leaders yes and just the 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 um and it also was fun to watch people you know, when I, jo- when I did the San Francisco one, I was one of the youngest people in the leadership. Today, uh, a few years later, I was one of the oldest people <laughs> in the group, which was, you know, at some point, right, you realize you're not the youngest person in the room anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, That's not a bad thing. Not a, no, no, no. But it's, but it's you got to adjust to it. You, know? <laughs> you, you, you have to adjust your sense of self. And But I came away with great respect. And it was always challenging to me, too, because... Now, if you disagree, uh, sometimes you disagree because maybe you have expertise that they don't have. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of appreciating their viewpoint. And so learning how to, again, this conflict management, learning how to negotiate, how to listen, how to move the ball forward, uh, what to compromise on, what to, you know, this, these are battles worth fighting, these are battles not worth fighting. That, that was all part of it. And I have great respect for my classmates. Um, and, and a lot of them have very different views in the, of the world than I, but but I don't doubt their sincerity, their integrity at all. Um, so the project that the, the class picked was to refurbish the safe house for uh, women and the, the women and children uh, program here. And my biggest contribution was donations. Uh, other people did work and did the organizing of it and it just it, it's so wonderful because people ex- escaping those traumatic environments, mm-hmm. children, to have a place that that doesn't feel like an afterthought, that feels mm-hmm. like a welcoming environment. I mean, for some of these people and some of these children, they've never had that experience. And that goes a long way to beginning to address the trauma. And so, you know, it, it turned out beautifully. It's beautiful. And I was there <laughs> at the ribbon cutting yeah. and it's happy, it's warm. And people feel welcome there. And the other thing that's amazing about it is the fiscal quality of the work that you guys were able to do. I think it was the highest. You you raised the bar for the value, the financial value of a project. And I know you were able to get people to come in and work on it and donate their time and donate resources. And it's just phenomenal. The Women's Center never would have been able to afford to transform that building like you guys were able to do it. No. Absolutely not. I, I believe last year's class, the uh, leadership eighteen had had collectively raised in in actual donations and in kind donations something like sixty thousand dollars, and our class was like, oh, we're going to beat that, we're going to beat that, and I thought you guys are crazy. That's a huge number to meet, mm-hmm. and they did. I mean, I think they I, th- well, I, if well you, above that's that. that's a hundred thousand dollar project. Easily. I mean, if you were just I think to it was out, more than that. Yeah, actually. if you were just they got. I mean, and that's another thing is it just warms your heart that all of these different trades mm-hmm. um, and different businesses said, yeah, mm-hmm. we'll do that. We'll, we'll come in and we'll help. And, and then some people you know, from my class, uh, God bless them, you know, they were there late at night. They were, you know, give, sacrifice their weekends, time away from their families. And uh, they, they did a remarkable job. And I'm going to give a shout out to Greg Berdu, fellow lion and past president of Stockton Hoost Lions, because I know he donated um, input on the project. And it just was amazing to see what you were able to do. And going back to what you said earlier, um, that you had such a diverse group of people and everyone had a role to play in that project whether they had connections to people with resources or money was donated or what have you. And to me, what you guys did was phenomenal. Yeah. Well, yeah, for example, one of the people that was, you know, did a lot of work toward it, so one, one of the people who really helped put together the funding and volunteer work, um, she's an executive director of another nonprofit in town. Uh, then we had somebody who you was, can who, name people yeah, if you want. Like, Go ahead. A construction, oh, that's up to you. A construction, you know, did did construction planning. <laughs> so <laughs> it was a, a, sort of a happy accident of, uh, or I guess you know, you just you put together a group of committed people and their skill sets sort of rise to the top and they they fill in they 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 fill in the boxes or they fill in the blanks that need to be filled in. Well, and there were challenges with that building. I. I 
I think when parts of wall and stuff, there was issues that you guys weren't anticipating. Um, I think even on the day of the ribbon cutting, there were some things that had to be changed to be ADA compliant. Right. And so there's just nothing is, is smooth. There's always going to be challenges. And to me, what was amazing is how you guys work together to overcome that and do something phenomenal for the Women's Center and all the people that that will help. And they never would have been able to have that on their own. Yeah. And, uh, you know, more credit is goes to many of my classmates than to me I did what I could but they there were some people who just amazed me with their ability to do that maybe awesome. they have, maybe they're younger and have more energy <laughs> probably no I don't say fewer equi fewer commitments but <laughs> but we, we all have things going you know, on you, you know if you want something done ask the busy person <laughs> that I think is true <laughs> that, that I totally think is true and and I want to give kudos to you though is where I saw you shine is when we did our leadership Stockton leadership Lodi joint trip to the Capitol. Um, and during some, some of the interim while we were waiting to hear from people, you were um, navigating and telling us about process and about the Capitol. And it was wonderful. I appreciated it. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's hard. Um, well, I spent uh, 12 to 15 years about uh, working in, in the Capitol or working for a governor. And it's hard to appreciate what's going on I mean you see lots of people it's it's hard to know the actual you know the, the sausage making once you see the sausage making mm -hmm. if you don't if you don't know what's going on so I thought it was really important for people to have that context in a um, I've tried to be really objective and I didn't want to you know I didn't want to give a political opinion or, or, or you know a speech I wanted them to be able to draw their own conclusions but I just wanted to give them a factual context for what was going on that particular day was the day before the governor was to release his May revise, and so on the um, budget. On the budget, for, yes, the May revise budget. He he issues a budget in January, and then he uh, and that's really a policy document. It has numbers attached, but it really, that really uh, tells you what the governor's priorities are. It's an outline. Yeah, it's an outline, and then it goes to, then it it goes to the different committees, and that's so the committees are trying to get through all of that uh, first look see. Uh, and then the most important committee is the appropriations because they decide whether that thing that has money attached to it moves forward or doesn't move forward. And we're also in the first year of a two-year session. So some things, um, so if, if you die, if a bill doesn't get it out of a committee at the end of the second year, then it has to start all over. If it doesn't get out at the end of the first year, it can be reworked and and revived for the second year. So so there's all that going on. and. And then you, the May revise that the governor pr presents, that is based on the most recent numbers that his Department of Finance gives. So that's, that's really the number budget. That's the one that, those are the numbers that they're gonna make decisions based on what they think, what revenue has come in and what they think revenue is gonna be coming in for what they can pay for, for the coming year. And we had a surplus this year, which was, was great to yes. hear. That Cal was fortunate. Yes, California has a, um, has a very uh, volatile tax structure because um, most of the taxes that are generated, uh, the increase in property taxes are pretty stable, uh, but most of the pro taxes that are generated are, are, are revenue from, from income and uh, capital gains. So those are very volatile and that's why we have these boom and bust cycles. And so it's really important when we do have a boom cycle to put a lot of that money away because the bus cycle can easily wipe out one year. One In one year, we wow. can easily wipe out uh, a surplus from the year before. And I don't think people realize that, so I'm glad you brought that up. And we were also really privileged to hear from Senator Kathleen Galjani and also Assemblywoman Susan Eggman. They both spent an extensive amount of time with our classes and answering questions and talking to us. And given the environment that you just described and people are scrambling to try and get things done i thought that was amazing that they gave us so much time i i did too and i i thought that wow you know i i teach part-time and i thought man to be able to have uh these people in front of you talk about the process uh the way they did it and, and an insider view that i i don't have uh, it was just fascinating and it was incredibly gracious of them and that was that was and educational. And I was awesome. sitting there thinking like, I wish I'd had this 
my first year in Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, seeing it as a member of the, this year's class of Leadership Lodi, um, it was interesting to see the two classes interact. And I remember being there as a part of Leadership Stockton. And the, even though it's the same program, it's very different. Um, and you alluded to having gone through it in San Francisco. And I think it's fascinating to see the inner workings of, this, of a city and to learn how things are done. And that part of it I love and the project aspect, but yet it's different. Our class is much smaller than the, the leadership Stockton. Um, but I'm, I'm enjoying the experience. I think it's wonderful. I would encourage anyone who's viewing or listening that's interested in making a difference in your community to participate in one of these programs because you get to learn so much. And it's, it's great because I'm sure you did this too at the end. Everybody gets up and talks about sort of their experience and how they grew. And it was just, it, it, and it was great. I mean, you, you could just, it was all very authentic and very genuine, but everybody, you know, they, even though we were this group, they all took away something different mm -hmm. from it. And I, I, mm -hmm. I thought that was great. I mean, this is, I think the program does exactly what it's supposed to do, which is go out and create a bunch of leaders and, and, uh, or at least help people refine their leadership skills mm -hmm. and, um, learn about things and see things from perspectives that they won't otherwise see. It's, it's at once humbling <laughs> and uh, really valuable. Awesome. And hopefully that, mean, that means that then we add value out back out in the community. Well, and definitely adding value back out in the community. And I still think so many people don't realize how much of a difference they can make. And this goes back to what you were, you were talking about earlier, that our city is moving upwards. Um, let's talk about the future potential of Stockton. Sure. What do you want to talk about it? Whatever you, <laughs> well, your perspective. Okay. So, uh, um, I, I spent some time in, I worked in San Francisco for the, for the then governor Gray Davis and I worked for the mayor of San Francisco, uh, then Frank Jordan. And, uh, when, when you have a booming economy in the, in the Bay area, that, tr that, uh, waves out into the Central Valley. And so it's waving out here right now. Um, and that's, we have a couple of challenges and the, and the one that I, the, you have to give the mayor credit for is the education level. Is if we have to, if we're going to attract larger employers, if we're going to attract that kind of business from, from Silicon Valley, and I think we can, uh, because because of proximity, we're very you know that's a huge asset. The proximity, um, we we have to have a workforce that they want to hire. Everything when when I went when I went through leadership st San Francisco and when when I worked in the mayor's office, we would meet with these businesses. We would we met with uh, we 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 met with CEOs and we we met with people at the time. They were, these were small gaming companies, right? <laughs> and we said, what can we do? How can we, as a city, help, help you? And they said, make sure that your transportation system is working, that your schools are working, that um, your parks are safe, and uh, that you have a good police force, and let us worry about the rest. Don't, just get out of our way. And two, um, we're going to go, we're here because this is where our employees want to be. And so, so for all the other things we hear about, if your employers, if your employees aren't there, you just can't attract the employers. And so our challenge is we, in order to get higher wage jobs, we have to educate more of our citizens. And I, you know, it's, it's not an uncommon problem, uh, particularly in, in communities that had a historically uh, agricultural based economy. Or high labor. Yes. Exactly. So we have to, um, that's, but that's a long-term strategy, mm -hmm. right? So, th so the short-term stuff is we've got to be more focused on the homegrown, the small businesses, the small developers, the person who wants to buy a building downtown or in midtown and wants to put up a duplex or a triplex or, uh, that what uh, a really common one is a commercial on on the ground floor and some living space upstairs um, and the reason for that is is you've got to create the way you create resilience in a community is you create a diversity of housing 
what we call the mi missing middle because right now we, you can buy a really expensive house um, you know we, we're built we, you can build a subdivision um, or you can build huge apartment buildings and they're separated and they're segregated and if if that subdivision or that apartment complex loses favor then you have a huge amount of housing that has a negative impact on an area and this is important right now because we are starting to see a so during the 60s and 70s the late 60s and 70s you saw people moving from the inner cities to the suburbs that is starting to turn around so people are moving from the suburbs to the cities they want walkable communities they want amenities nearby them and this is not just uh, you know the Millennials which always get tasked like oh the young people <laughs> that's what they want <laughs> baby boomers are downsizing um, and so we have to be so Stockton has this opportunity because we have this incredible infrastructure downtown mm -hmm. that part of the reason it's, it's so incredible is because it was neglected for so long and so it was preserved. And the waterfront. And the we waterfront. Have the waterfront that's, <coughs> that's essentially undeveloped. Undeveloped. And, and I'm going to talk about that for a minute in a second. So, so those things, so attracting people to the downtown, attracting people to where they want to live, it's going to be really important. One of the challenges is going to be as that happens, uh, people in poverty are moving to the suburbs and the challenge is providing services to p suburbs in poverty is much harder than providing um, services to people in poverty in a concentrated inner city interesting yeah so I don't know how that's going to shake out but but it's something that we all have to keep an eye on um, <clears throat> but f like the waterfront so s there's a lot of little things we can do one of them is there's this whole um, movement called road diets which a lot of the streets in our downtown area are one ways and that's hostile to people on foot I hate it it's hostile it's to host people driving it's, too. it is it or is parking or any par of that. exactly and so um, interestingly enough communities that have gone through road diets turning turning one-way streets into two-way streets narrowing them slowing the traffic uh, the people who commute through those areas the commute time has increased uh, approximately anywhere between 45 and 90 seconds so <laughs> so people so it's it's an insignificant amount of delay in travel and part of the reason is because when you slow them you're you're not racing up to the next light you're not you know you're it's actually traffic is actually moving pretty calmly the other thing is as a result of uh, as a result of El Dorado through downtown and Center Street through downtown you are you are uninvited from our waterfront mm -hmm. you know, who who mm -hmm. somebody w i went on a, i went on a walk with third city coalition one day and we went jasmine shout yeah, out to jasmine's jasmine. yes ja jasmine leaks project and uh we were at the library and and the park in front and she said how do we get more people to to come to this park and i said who who's going to want to take a stroller and young children across five lanes of four lanes of traffic mm -hmm. to get to a park that on the other side there's another five lanes of traffic mm -hmm. it's not going to happen it's not going to happen and parking and right. parking meters and we parking and parking yeah which we can talk about that too. <laughs> <laughs> but but if you yeah well that that is the thing is if you encourage if you slow down the car and if you encourage walking and you encourage biking and they got to be safe i mean i'd love to bike to work i'm a little bit not sure that I want to drive down Center or or El Dorado on a bike. Um, I don't think you're alone in that. Yeah. <laughs> Sacramento just did something that I find really interesting is is they put in these bike lanes and they put in they put the bike lane next to the sidewalk and the traffic and and the cars parallel park on the outside of the bike lane. So you have a oh. I think which I I think that's a great idea. Makes a lot more sense to yeah. me, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, so. And, you, know, you know, these are all trade-offs that we have to make, but we really need to have some honest conversations about that. The more we, the more we keep people in their cars isolated, the less community we build. And I agree. And so it, it isn't. Look, I have five classic cars. I probably put collectively, you know, two thousand miles a year on them. But but I, I am not anti-automobile. I just I I, I am pro-community. And I want people to be able to feel connected. And I work downtown, but 
there's not a um, card store. I, uh, there's not a stationary store where I can go buy cards and business mm -hmm. supplies if I just need to pick something up. There's not a clothing store if I need to buy a tie or I messed up my shirt. Uh, there's not a gift shop. Amenities. Yeah, there's not, you know, and these, they're, they're restaurants and, you know, all the fab, fabulous little family restaurants and the people who are doing their stuff and there's stuff going on. But, but if you don't have people there, why would those businesses be there? And But people aren't going to be there when it's so unwelcoming. And the people that work there often leave after work. They right. don't want to stay there. That's right. And they're not going to stay there without the amenities, although th there's a huge pent-up demand for people to want to live downtown. Um, mm -hmm. Cork Companies has refurbished, uh, not refurbished, but Bear Paw, uh, a company from Citrus Heights, has refurbished uh, the Trethaway building from offices to live work. There's a waiting, they, there's, that's not even occupiable yet. There's a waiting list of people awesome. who want to move into those units. Excellent. Yeah, it's just, and they refurbished another building. And because of the amazing demand, uh, and it really was amazing, they, they bought the building at 500 uh, Main Street, um, which was offices, and they're converting that into housing. Great. And court company, I don't know if you were there, I don't, I don't remember seeing you, but court companies was doing to do an open house walking tour. And I thought, well, I want to go because I want to be supportive, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I go, and they had this, they had these food, this food at, at court tower, um, lots of really nice hors d'oeuvres and stuff, and people weren't eating it. And I was expecting, oh, the week night, 20, 30 people. There were like 75 people. Wow. And they're That's like, awesome. We want to go see the places. We want to go. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and they were walking, and people of all ages, and they're going, uh, they're, walk, they're, sit, they're walking through these units, and they're just, right, they're, they're just the, the wall. They're not, not even the walls. They're just the sticks. Um, and they're going, oh, well, this could be our living room, and this could be our, and I was, I was just amazed. It's very excited. exciting. And I'm like, good, because now, you know, these early pioneer businesses will also be willing. I went to... Because uh, there's a demand. Because there's a demand. Once there's a demand, it will be filled. I went to, uh, you know, I said to a friend one Sunday, I said, you know, we, we're, let's go down to Cast Iron and have brunch because I want to be supportive of downtown businesses. And we went down and, you know, there's nothing going on on a Sunday <laughs> downtown. And but well, there behold, should be. There yeah, should but be the place was packed and there was a line out the door. So what that tell you, people are will if, if there's a reason to go downtown, go. I would love to see, for example, I would love to see Main Street in front of the Fox Theater um, abandoned. And I would love to see that parking lot by the old courthouse um, covered over. Not uh, but they could leave parking under. But I would love to see that be a public space mm -hmm. where we could have art festivals. Mm -hmm. And then then the theater could become part of that. And mm -hmm. that would be a gathering space because one of the mm -hmm. things we do lack downtown, not not just the the businesses I told you about, but you all you have to have meeting spaces. You have to have peop spaces where people can meet and congregate, and we don't have that right now. But I'm bullish that uh, people are investing in it and that we have a wonderful opportunity to do these things. I think um, the the best example we have is what's going on in, in university. Uh, park what, what they're doing over there the neighborhood taking charge mm -hmm. planting trees mm -hmm. sprucing it's up awesome. the buildings if we get more we you know we need some of that in midtown in mm -hmm. pieces of midtown and there are groups meeting i know reinvent stockton has convened some meetings in in the midtown magnolia neighborhood and we need to do more of that and i'm, I'm hoping i'm hoping that we when the city hires a new city manager that we will have a person who is committed to that community building. And I'm glad that you brought that up because I was going to ask you about that because it's so new and shocking and relevant. Um, I look at it as opportunity for what you just said to just promote more positivity in our community. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that uh, the former city manager, he was the right man, to right person to steer the city through the conclusion of the bankruptcy and take them out. But... At, at, at a certain point, you need somebody who wants to do the community building. I think he was probably a really good numbers guy. He wasn't out in the community a lot, so I can't really speak to that, although I can draw conclusions because he wasn't out in the community a lot. Um, but also, I really hope that they find a city manager who wants to live in Stockton because I just find it so contradictory the, the person who's in charge and responsible for improving the quality of life in a city, 
on the day-to-day basis, not the elected officials, but that that person doesn't have the experience of a residence. I want that person to drive down California Street at five o'clock. I want him or her to see the abandoned furniture, to see the abandoned cars, to see, yes. And and I and and when I was driving here, uh, the boarded up house or the abandoned car, I want that person to go back to the office and call that department and call the city council member from that district and say, let's get together, and let's fix it. let's fix this. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I don't no, think I that's unreasonable. I don't think that's unreasonable, and I think that probably ninety five percent of people that live here feel that way. I mean, if if we're going to use our tax dollars to pay this person. I would like to think that this person is shopping in our stores, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. sending his keeping or her children to, local. yes, keeping dollars local, uh, investing in this community, has a house, knows what it's like to find services, knows what it's like to put to his or her children through school. Um, and I, I, I just don't think that's, a, that's too high a bar. I can't believe no, I that in a city totally. of 300,000 that there's nobody qualified to run the city who loves it. Well, and even if it's not someone that's local, if it's someone that comes from an outside area, they can move and be, be and, and embrace Stockton. Exactly, but move they must. I, I just feel like if you want to run a community, mm-hmm. you know, what, what's, I think it's sort of like um, you can be the CEO of Ford Motor Company, but don't drive Ford cars. <laughs> or know? don't show up at the office. Yeah, don't go, yeah, don't, yeah, exactly. It's like, how? How does that work? <laughs> like if you don't try your product, <laughs> you don't experience your product. Uh, I think we have a lot of good people in city government, but I just think the culture needs to move to, um, and it has to start at the top, is like the conversations have to start with yes. The conversations have to start with how can we make this happen for you? We're, res- we're resource challenged, but that doesn't mean we can't partner that doesn't mean we can't clear some of the hurdles. That doesn't mean we can't. And those things don't cost money. Uh, but, but how can we just let's move this through and, and, and not well, these are the rules. It's like, well, how can we help you meet the guidelines? Not, well, if you don't meet the guidelines, don't talk to us. So with what you just said, I'm going to ask you something about that's relevant to the Miracle Mile. Um, so right now, currently for rent, um, space office space available are the businesses that were closed down by the city about two years ago um, connected with Empire Theater and I'd lo- love to hear your feedback on that uh, and the whole situation and, and where we're going from here yeah I, I it's hard to know because you know I know there was some litigation on that and you hear rumor and innuendo about what the landowner did or didn't do and these uh, these improvements that were made or not improvements but alterations without permits um, and it's, it's a terrible it's a terrible outcome obviously to close all those businesses down I'm, and and none of those biz- those were all locally owned businesses um, I I don't understand the intransigence of of a property owner to not just figure out a way to get the improvements done. Um, I think, as as a as a owner of properties, um, you have a responsibility to your community, and also, I mean, that couldn't have made that couldn't have made financial sense. It couldn't have made financial sense to to let all your tenants. Uh, be evicted and to live to have a building vacant for two years or three years um, and and engage in litigation with the city over it uh, part of it is like oh well bite the bullet do the investment and move forward the city does not um, the city does not engage in that type of takeover of a property lightly or easily um, they do a lot of work to try to bring people into compliance before it gets to that level. I think the tragedy there is those of us who uh, participate and shop and and frequent the Miracle Mile as well as those businesses paid a disproportionate price for that. I don't know. I would agree. Yeah, I don't know what the solution would have been. I I, I wasn't privy to the discussions that went on between um, the city and the landowner, but I, I certainly hope that we can move away from that. I also think that raises a really good point about downtown and there's a there's an interesting it hasn't happened here 
which I'm a big advocate of, exploring whether or not there's a vacancy tax for property owners who leave their buildings vacant. Um, and you'd have to explore that. But the concept, the, the rationale is that if, if I have a vacant building and I'm just sitting here sitting on the concept of the appreciation of the building, I am, I am benefiting from the other property owners who aren't vacant, who are improving mm -hmm. the property, mm -hmm. at, while they are suffering from my vacant building. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't we reallocate that cost, that burden of the devaluation and the lack of attractiveness in the neighborhood to where it is being caused. And it invites it. vandalism and invites other issues. Absolutely. And you have people in downtown buildings who say, well, I'm not going to sell because it's cheaper for me to hold it um, at vacant because there's no cost to me. Well, maybe there should be a cost to you because there's a cost to the community. And mm -hmm. so if the community is going to mm -hmm. bear this cost, maybe you should compensate the community for the cost that they're bearing. Um, I don't know how that would look. Uh, well, how do other cities do that? Um, I'm not familiar. I don't know all the details of how other places do it. I think what you have to, so what you got to do is you got to, what you don't want to do is you don't want to discourage it, development. You want to find a way to incentivize people. So if you got to find ways to help make the numbers work. Um, but also if somebody's working and making a good faith effort to get their building rented, then we ought to do that. But uh, and, and allow people to re re refurbish a building. But if someone's just going to buy a building and sit on it vacant, um, because and you know we've had this happen, people buy a building downtown who don't live here. They live in the Bay Area. They're like, we couldn't find cheaper property anywhere else. I was looking for a place to park my money. I don't want to do anything else. Well, that's not helpful. That doesn't help us, you know. That there, yeah, we have it a definitely lot doesn't help us. And and if they're going to do that. Maybe that could be rented by a nonprofit to use as a meeting area, an activity right. area, something like that, oh. instead of just sitting. Oh yeah, when when I when I worked with Court Company full time, you know, we would get calls from theater companies, from other entities looking for space. Mm -hmm. uh, there's especially a, downtown a, now. Yeah, places downtown, and so you know we have to have a mix of market rate and affordable housing and we have to because you want a diversity of people um, that's what makes a place interesting and exciting um, and grow and grow absolutely and because it, you know if you look if you look at these planned and, and I, I think um, the 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 water around the Hyatt is a good example so if, if you were here when that was a brand new it was all filled up and it was beautiful and it's like a oh, perfect but as years go through there are vacancies, the kinds of businesses come and go and change. And so you have to, you, but that's one large scale development. And when you go to that large scale development, it's great when it's on the upside, but it's when it's on the downside, it all goes down. So if you have a variety of buildings and a variety of uses um, and a variety of clientele, you make your community much more resilient so that it, that it evens out, it levels out those boom and bust cycles because one piece can can then fill the gap that another piece um, e abandoned, for example. All right, and we talked about um, an incoming city manager and having that person live here. What else besides the development in different places do you think would change or improve things for Stockton? How, how do we, we talked about education and one thing that you didn't mention that I'm very passionate about is trades. And I feel like that's a huge place where we can meet the gap where people who might not be ready to go to college, to go to UOP or Stanislaus, but they can connect with a trade and do an apprenticeship or even go to a trade school and be able to have a marketable skill that pays a living wage job. Oh, yeah. And I apologize for, for not speaking about that because there are some people downtown working on creating maker spaces and there's the Hatch Workshop, which is a nonprofit that um, is partnering with the school district to provide um, wood shop uh, and metal metal programs because absolutely uh, my life is so much better because I went to college but it's not for everybody uh, I, I think what w the we, we got to get away from this either or and it's like um, the point is is we need to have this this list of viable options that people can make a living wage doing something they enjoy 
and whether that be a college education or some form of continuing education in the trades, we need to do that when, you know, we're going to show our age here, Julie, but, but right when we were in school, they had word shop, they yes. had, they had auto shop, they had these pl- programs, they had these <laughs> programs, they don't have them anymore. Um, and so we have to rebuild those because this is ridiculous. That, and, and you're absolutely right. Those trades provide a, a good wage and there's a huge shortage of people mm-hmm. in the trades. Mm-hmm. So absolutely, I don't want this to supplant, you know, and we need to have a mix. We need to up our, the number of people with college degrees in San Joaquin County, but we need to up our trades. Yes. And if we're going to have building, I don't want our city or our county contracting with people from the Bay Area to come here. I want those jobs to be filled by people that live here and keep our dollars here. And that's a win-win for it, everyone. It absolutely is. So I'm really, I'm really uh, pleased with what Hatch is doing. And we just, Hatch is just one place. We need to do more of that. We absolutely have mm-hmm. to uh there's there's no well heck i'm sure i'm sure that a, a tradesman plumber and a tradesman electrician can make more money than i do today mm-hmm. uh, and that's okay with me uh but we need to be able to f- have a pipeline for people to go into those fields definitely um anything else that you think could make a huge difference in our community and anything else you'd like to talk about no. that we haven't touched on no i think that i i'm really supportive of of the move to put a CSU campus here or a, 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 a poly. I hope that we put it in a area of high population concentration. You know, when, when the CSU system was conceived, it was conceived as commuter schools. And, uh, you know, from an environmental and cost perspective, if you require somebody to have a car or require them to, to, to have to get to campus and it's a long way away, it diminishes it. It actually causes people to not complete their schooling. Well, it's and if we have bike lanes, people could exactly, bike there. That exactly. would be perfect. So I think there's lots of opportunities. I know that's a longer-term strategy, but it is absolutely necessary for for the long-term health. I agree I mean, totally. You know, we have Humphreys, which does a great job. We have uh, University of the Pacific and Delta, Delta. Um, and we have the little program, little program relative to you know what Stanislaus State does. Uh, I just think this area deserves it's entitled to there's a huge need um i hope that we uh are able to do that and in the interim an equalizer an equalizer is given the opportunities and um and then we can uh create the kind of vibrant community that we're entitled to and really there's such there's there's a lot of heart here right i mean people love this place and every time i talk about loving this place people light up and because they're like we're so glad to hear you say this like well why not? I mean, it, it doesn't deserve some of the bad press that it gets as people say, oh, you know, the high crime rate. Well, but the there's crime everywhere. Yes. And the crime that we have is highly concentrated. And, you know, typically if you're a, a member of a gang or you're a young male between the ages of 16 and 29, you're probably you had high much higher risk of, of becoming a victim or a perpetrator of that crime and we need to turn that around we need to turn that absolutely it's not that we shouldn't ignore it but we, we need, need opportunity to be, for that sector absolutely so that the, the gang is not yeah. a desirable option well interestingly enough um there was a book written by some usc professors and it said it was why americans fear the wrong things and it talked about the crime is at historic lows lower than it's ever been uh violent crime is lower than it's ever been part of the reason we feel less safe today is that the news media covers it all so much more. I mean, you, you can get on and get instantaneous of the latest crime anywhere, mm-hmm. everywhere. But mm-hmm. if you go back in history and you read some, some, there were some horrible, heinous, terrible crimes committed in earlier times. Um, and, and we're in a safer world than ever, but people are putting bars on their windows and security doors on their say, houses. It doesn't feel like that. It doesn't feel like Our that. Our courthouse just started now with metal detectors yeah. and you're searched as you go in. Exactly. And exactly. our county, sorry, not our, car, our courthouse, no, our county yeah, building. Because the courthouse always had them. But, the um, county building. Although I do, that. you know, a number of years ago, I, can, I was shocked. This is a long time ago, but, you know, 15, 20 years ago, going into the courthouse for the first time. Um, and people literally putting weapons on the, on the, wow. on the belt going through. We're like, wow. wow, wow, wow. I mean, you know, yeah, it, it, we, need to, we need to be mindful of it, but we also need to, we need to be mindful to be safe, but we also need to be mindful uh, that we do live in a pretty safe world. And we need to find ways to build more communities so that there are more people 
who are engaging in those processes and making the world safer. And I like that. To me, building community, going back to what you were talking about early on, organizations, and that people want that, but that maybe the organizations aren't quite tailored to their needs. Right. And we're finding that in the service clubs. Um, in my uh, Rotary Club, we actually have a satellite group that meets. It's a younger generation, and they don't want all the formality of the traditional meeting. And they're mainly having a mixer style meeting. Or right. I know there's another Rotary Club here in Stockton that routinely once a month has an evening mixer instead of a meeting. And so we need to look at making, getting together, providing opportunities for that so we can work together t to solve problems and just spend time together and, and have quality of life. Yeah, we just, we just did a survey of our members and I was surprised, I was pleasantly surprised that a large percentage of them said one of the reasons we belong is is for the opportunity to socialize and interact with other mm -hmm. people. Which is great. Uh, yeah. We need more opportunities like that. Um, any final comments? No, thank you very much for having me. You do an amazing job out in the community, so I was humbled and flattered that you invited me on. Well, thank you, and, and you have great wisdom, and you're doing a lot of important things, and I was really honored that oh. you agreed to be here today, and thank you for stopping by for the second time so that we could do this <laughs> so interview. We, yes. This time we got the video so people could, yeah. <laughs> All right. And with Thank that, you. I'm going to sign off. I am the voice of Sam Wakey.